Chapter 19 She stood straight after giving Ross a dry cold kiss and walked to the bedroom and locked the door. She didn't undress. She fell back on the bed on the comforter and stretched out her arms and wondered about the brooding exciting man she left only hours before. The man who had made her feel more alive than any man she could remember. Watching up at the ceiling, she looked to see a chandelier. Her arms out to the side, she stretched her legs out. She remembered being in that position before. Was it at the BDSM club she had just left earlier? But why didn't someone know her? Not even the man who ran the club and the other one she liked, he had never met her before. From what she felt, she was experienced, and that means she had been working at this a long time or working at some club. But why didn't she know this? There were too many unanswered questions for Alex. If she depended on Ross to tell her, she would be waiting a lifetime because it appeared he was unable or didn't want her to know too much about him or herself. Was it to protect her or to protect himself? She thought. Alex pulled her phone out of her pocket. The one Ross had given her when she lost her memory. She examined the numbers. She searched her conscience for the number that had been popping up in her mind every so often. Now when she needed to recall it, she couldn't. There were no phone numbers keyed in her phone, only a text from Ross, demanding that she come home before he called the police. She deleted it. Reaching into her purse, she pulled out Brandon's business card and keyed in his number into her phone. There was a contract she had signed from the club. She opened it and read it for the first time. She had signed it without reading it. That was a stupid thing to do. After a quick scan, she realized that there was nothing she should be concerned about. Her eyes caught a number on the contract. She called it, and a gravelly voice answered. She heard a man and woman's voice in the background, and then it went silent. Mr. Rossini? Yes, speaking. This is. I know your voice, you're the girl with no name. I've given you one. You're Kelly. You have to come in and sign a formal contract if you expect to work here and get paid. And speaking of payment, that rich dude left you a tip. I don't know what you did to him, but I could use a tip like that. But then I'm not a girl, and I'm not into that sort of lifestyle. I just run the place. I want to know if I could come in at my own choosing, but have an exclusive client? I mean, Rossini didn't let her finish. You want to be on call for just that one client that you saw today, right? Rossini said. Yes, but I want the option to pick the time and days. You want a lot considering that you just started here. I don't know, Rossini said trying to play hardball. He knew if she didn't come in to service Blackstone that he would have a hard time getting up the money he owed Jonas, and he would have both of them looking over his shoulders until the money was paid. Rossini wasn't young anymore, and in this game his time was short. He had maybe five good years left, and then he would have to retire. There was a good retirement in Florida, or there could be a bad retirement somewhere else. He needed money because he would lose millions paying off Jonas. He had taken Jonas's money to renovate a mansion that didn't need redecorating. He thought he had gotten away with not paying Maximilian's crazy brother. Until now. I think I can arrange something. Call me in the morning. Alex hung up. She couldn't wait to see the man again. She fell asleep thinking about the handsome stranger whom she bonded with in the most intense way. She couldn't wait to see what he had in store for her and what she could do to bring out the best or the worst in him. Whatever it was, it had been profoundly exciting and exhilarating. 
When she woke, she was still dressed in her pants and jacket. Somehow she had kicked off her shoes. Standing, she stripped down to her bra and panties. She felt the presence of the man inside her body, but it didn't distress her or make her feel unclean as she had felt with Ross. It made her smile, and she discarded her clothes and walked naked into the bathroom. She turned on the water, waiting until it was the right temperature, before stepping into the oval tub. As her body became acclimated to the hot water, she closed her eyes. She felt someone in the room, and her eyes opened quickly. What are you doing in here? I want privacy. He sat on the edge of the tub and placed his hand in it. It's too hot. I like the water hot. It could blemish your skin. You like when I help bath you. When was that? I don't remember that. Please leave. Ross stood. He looked down at her with a sour face. Alex was beginning to become her own person, and he couldn't stop it. She didn't remember anything in her past, but her personality began to show through. She had never been one to allow anyone to dictate her life and lead her around and tell her what she should or shouldn't do. Since she was a girl, she ran away from home because she had been rebellious to her parents. They wanted to give her a curfew, tell her who her friends should or shouldn't be, and she ran away because of that, so she could be with the people she felt most comfortable with. Alex closed her eyes and when she opened them, Ross was gone. She finished her relaxed bath without Ross looming over her trying to bath her, touching her where she didn't want to be touched anymore. Now she had feelings for someone. Feelings she never thought would be possible. She had walked around in a daze not knowing who she was and feeling dead inside, but now new life had been blown into a youthful numb body. At first, Alex didn't mind being fondled by Ross. Maybe it was youthful arousal, and he was there reminding her that she was young and alive. Not remembering her name, not remembering her age and whether she liked this man or not, had thrown her for a loop. And it didn't help Ross's cause that he never said whether she had family or friends. Ross didn't say it because he didn't know anything about her, except that she was the wife of Maximilian Blackstone. However, he knew she had children, which made it all so despicable even to himself. But he managed to overcome that by convincing himself that he would treat her as if he loved her. When she had dressed, she walked to where she smelled breakfast. She had been hungry since last night. Ross glanced up with a smile. I didn't sleep well with you away from me. I wish you would come back to bed tonight. His words had been said so easy and gently that it made Alex feel as if she had been dishonest to him. She thought about calling Mr. Rossini and telling him not to expect her again. Alex sat at a large table looking across at Ross. A plate was already placed in front of her, as well as the silverware. Two maids came with a choice of food, and she nodded as they placed it on her plate. Normally she just had cheese, fruit, yogurt, and a bagel, but she was hungry today and she had what Ross was having for breakfast. Eggs, bacon, and an English muffin. A large glass of orange juice and milk. Alex looked at Ross watching her and watching her plate. He was handsome, but it was a kind of handsome that she didn't trust. A man who doesn't know his appeal to women can't be trusted. He's always trying to prove that he's desired by every woman or he clings on too tight and smothers her with his insecurity. Ross was the clinging insecure type, Alex thought. That's the feeling she got from him. But the stranger, now that is a man who knows who he is. She smiled as she thought of him. How could she not see him again? A man like him, she wanted him desperately. Alex's thoughts were interrupted by Ross's words. I want to take you to Manhattan for some shopping. He looked at her, waiting for her to finish drinking her juice. 
She placed the glass down and looked at him. He didn't know what she would say, but she smiled. Good. I need some new things. You can drop me off on Fifth Avenue, and I'll run into Saks, and you can do what you do. Why don't you buy some things too? They have these suits by Tom Ford that I think you would like. Alex thought a second. Why would she know the name of a designer? She didn't read any men magazines, yet she knew the name of men designers. She shook off that thought as if it was nothing. She felt she had read or seen the name on a billboard. She had to, she thought. After eating everything on her plate, she leaned over and kissed Ross. I'll be ready in a half an hour. Is that good for you? Of course. Then that settles it. She turned and marched to the room she had slept in last night. It was where she had left her phone and where she had called the maids to bring her clothing. She plopped down on the bed, turned on the light on the nightstand and reached for her phone. Sitting up and pulling a pillow behind her, she called Rossini. It was 11 a.m. when Rossini reached for the phone at his desk. He had a hard night and things weren't going as he thought. The money wasn't coming in as fast as he needed, and Jonas had disappeared. He wasn't his babysitter, but Max had made it clear to Rossini that Jonas shouldn't leave the area. Aside from Jonas sitting and walking all night in the garden, he wasn't a problem. But now he had disappeared and became a problem especially since he called Max. What is it, Kelly? At first Alex didn't recognize who he was talking about, but then it was the name he had given her. She had better remember it. I wanted to tell you that I should be in Manhattan and at your club about two o'clock. I'll tell Mr. Blackstone, I mean the submissive. And he hit the button, and it was quiet. Alex stared at the phone and wondered where she heard that name. It was too familiar, and then it came to her. That taxi driver named Brandon said he had worked for him and his wife. She didn't want to come between a man and his wife. But maybe he had a reason for coming to the club. Maybe his wife didn't know about his specific need for bondage. But it wasn't just bondage that he was looking for. She felt him. She knew it was more. She couldn't be a part of that, and she would end it tonight. Even if she didn't like Ross that much, she felt a bond with him. But then she felt an even bigger bond with Mr. Blackstone. She would make up her mind once she had a chance to talk to Blackstone. Maybe he would walk away without a word. Could she walk away from him? It would be hard, but she could do it. She could go away to Italy with Ross and never see him again. Alex picked up her purse, dropped her phone in, and walked out of the room and greeted Ross in the hall. He took her hand and she felt nothing. He smiled at her and she felt nothing. He kissed her on the lips and she felt nothing. She had to feel something because she needed to feel to convince her she was alive and could love something or someone. But she did have feelings for someone. She had strong feelings for Blackstone. She desperately needed more of him inside of her, feeling her skin, taking her and filling her with his desires. Waves of pure pleasure and ecstasy throbbed through her when she fantasized about him. Chapter 20 As Ross sat down next to Alex in the limo and made a call from his car, heading to Manhattan, Alex eyed his hand as he laid his open palm next to her. Alex placed a hesitant hand in his, and Rossini made a hesitant call to Maximilian Blackstone. When Max heard his phone he scowled at it. It was Rossini. Should he answer it? He knew what it was about, and he was undecided about Kelly. It was too soon for Rossini to be calling about the final payment for Jonas's interest in the club. So it had something to do with Kelly. He closed his eyes for a second 
and rubbed his hand across his chin. He didn't want another session with the young woman because that one time had caused him to question his marriage and question who he was as a husband. But whether he was a loving father, no one could question that. He lived for his children, and he had lived for Alex. But not knowing what had happened to her, and whether she left him for someone else, had thrown this into question. And he had allowed too much time to go by without contacting the authorities. And that would be the number one question they would ask if he didn't find her soon. He hit the button on his phone because he was nervous and desperate. Imagine that, Maximilian Blackstone afraid. Mr. Blackstone, Kelly has agreed to see you today, Rossini said, hiding his eagerness. Max's phone buzzed. There was an incoming call. I have to take this. I'll get back to you, Max said to Rossini. Max had left instructions for the nanny to call him if it was an emergency. The nanny was calling from his home in Montana, where his children had been two weeks without their mother. He knew that sick feeling. He and Jonas had been raised by others because his entire family had died in a plane crash. Mr. Blackstone. Max's heart sank. He expected to hear that someone was sick because his children were young, and taking them from one environment to another could have consequences, the doctor warned. They could have bouts of illness until they adapted to their surroundings and the change of climate. What with all the trees that surrounded his property and the animals, Max expected the worse when he heard the nanny's voice. He swallowed in a deep breath and braced for the worse. In his mind, something had to be wrong with the children. He felt overwhelmed. He had never had such feelings before. These feelings experienced since Alex's disappearance were something new and alien. His thoughts lashed out at Alex. She should have been there to take care of their children. They need their mother more than anyone, he thought. There were too many things he had to do today, and now he couldn't manage to do anything. Blaming Alex didn't help his disposition. He wasn't a man to blame others. He held himself accountable for what could have gone wrong in his life. After all, he was the older of the two. His thoughts were to find Alex and then see to his children. Put everything in perspective and order. He liked order, but there was too much chaos in his life now, and that would prevent him from functioning properly. He was a wreck, and being away from Manhattan by going back to Montana would make him even worse if that were possible. Yes. What is it? He didn't let his concern show in his voice. It's Maxim. He doesn't want to go to school. He wants his mother to take him. He misses her. When is she coming back, Mr. Blackstone? Try your best to get him to go to school. Tell him we're buying him a pony, anything. I have a crisis here, Max said, his voice raised but calm. But I don't like to lie to the children. It's not a lie. I will buy him a pony when I return. What about Mrs. Blackstone? What am I to tell him about her? Would you rather tell him the truth? That his mother is missing, and she may be dead. Max's voice was cold, but he held steady. However, he had given away too much information. Let me speak to Maxim. After Max spoke to his young son, Maxim appeared to be happy with the story about the pony. He asked once about his mother, which brought some relief to Max. He couldn't handle any more than one question from his son. Max said goodbye and reassured his son that they would be home soon. He placed the phone down looking at it trying to decide what to do next, then he picked it up again. He can't go on like this, he thought. His children needed him, and he needed Alex. He took a hard breath and called Rossini back. Rossini here. 
Mr. Blackstone, I recognized your voice. You and your brother. Yes, Rossini, I've heard that before. What were you telling me about Kelly? That is her name. Well, not exactly. He paused. She didn't give her real name. I thought you ran a first-class establishment. How is it you didn't get her name? How can you do a background check on her? You sent me to her without checking her background? Max said, his voice alarming and gruff. His tone furious. Do you want me to tell her you won't see her again? Another silence. No. Don't tell her that. At this point, Max was thinking about how he felt because of her, and because of her, he was able to sleep the previous night. Only Alex and this woman had ever been able to relax him when his stress had been agonizingly unbearable. The tension in his body kept him up last night, and he had to lessen the effects before it took over him, and he wouldn't be able to function again. Rossini smiled on the other end of the phone. He knew Kelly had gotten under Blackstone's skin, and Max was taken with her. Rossini saw that as his way to recoup the money he lost in the renovations of the club, get it from Blackstone, charge an excessive amount, and then funnel it to Jonas, where he could get rid of him soon, and get the Blackstone twins off his back. It was a foolproof plan. He deceived himself into thinking that new men like Maximilian Blackstone. BDSM was addictive, and once they found someone who touched that nerve, was able to seduce them with whips, bondage, and their bodies, a man like Maximilian would pay any price. Max hung up the phone and looked around his apartment. He missed Alex. He walked to her luggage and opened it. Not because he was looking for a clue to where she had gone, and if she left with someone, but because he wanted to smell her clothing. He picked up a floral silk scarf she had worn and placed it to his nose and inhaled. The memories swirled around his head, and he closed his eyes. He could see her and feel her body, and he became lost in the moment. What woke him was the thoughts of Kelly. He had to see Kelly one more time. He didn't know what was worst being unfaithful mentally or physically, but he knew it was both. And everything she brought to him was intoxicating and dangerous. Dangerous because he couldn't get enough of her. There was too much tension inside of him from his lack of sleep and from waiting to hear something about Alex. Time would pass if he went to the club. So he convinced himself that he should do that first. Before seeing the private investigator, before seeing his lawyers, and before sleeping. He would get to the club and talk to Jonas, and wait for the girl in the room. He needed what she offered more than anything now. He needed to think and sleep. Watching up at the ceiling all night waiting to go to sleep was like being in hell, he thought. Sleeping would have prevented him from thinking about Alex, and the guilt he felt by going to another woman to satisfy a need. A need that was so inescapable within him. Max was curious about the young woman. He didn't plan on having sex with her. It was to be a session where she would whip him, and that would cleanse his mind and body to be able to handle what he had to do next. Now it had turned into more than that. He became eager to see her again. The excitement welled up inside of him, where he became nervous. He glanced at his hands, they were shaking, and he began pacing, waiting for the doorman to tell him that his car and driver was waiting outside. He couldn't wait. Max grabbed his brown satchel and opened his door and strode into the elevator. When he reached the lobby of his apartment, he saw the dark SUV limo. I'm already down, Max said as he strode past the doorman, who had his hand on the buzzer ready to call him. He stepped into the black SUV, and the car angled to the street and took off as cabs honked behind the car. When Max arrived at the BDSM club, 
Ross was dropping Alex off in Midtown at Saks Fifth Avenue. I'll call you when I'm ready. I have lots of shopping and don't expect it to be an hour trip. You know how women are, she said, as she gave Ross a quick, deliberate kiss and trotted out of the open door of the limo. When she sashayed into the store, she waited until she saw the limo with Ross inside pull off and travel down Fifth Avenue. Alex hurried into the restroom and hauled out the black wig from her large purse and placed it over her auburn curls. It took a few minutes to adjust and to put on light makeup. She didn't remember wearing makeup, but she was sure she did wear a light coating of lipstick. She left the restroom, headed for the door, and glanced over at a counter filled with Tom Ford perfume. She walked straight to a black bottle and said, I'll take that bottle. Do you want to smell it first? The sales girl asked with a smile. I know how it smells, Alex said spraying a tiny bit of the sample on her neck, waiting for the girl to wrap it, and then she placed it in a box and a bag. She knew that scent but didn't know why. When the sales girl handed it to Alex, she passed some on Alex's wrist without her permission. Alex glanced up, but it was too late. Alex gave her a closed smile and walked to the entrance after dropping the perfume in the small plastic tote into her purse. She walked out of the store and hailed a cab. It took ten minutes in heavy traffic for the cab to pull up to the entrance of the BDSM club. She looked around and saw the same black SUV limo parked to the side. The same driver sat reading the daily news and waiting. The limo had been there when she left the day before. It was the only one parked there in the middle of the day. She looked into her bag and pulled out her mask and put it on. The black mask with gold trim covered most of her face except her eyes and mouth. Since it was the day before Halloween, she didn't look out of place. Just someone who had started celebrating early.